we're a couple days past a full moon, uh, which in summer, which it is, of course, in the northern hemisphere, is a particularly glorious, glorious thing. And you can, uh, on a clear summer night where it stays late, um, it stays light late, uh, and the full moon comes up uh, either a little bit before or a little bit after, depending on exactly where you are in the full moon, uh, the, the sunset you might be able to navigate at night without any external sources of light. So, you know, not in a city where, where there are all these external sources of light, but if you're in nature and, you know, not so much in the forest, but if you're in nature with a, an open sky, wandering around at night and navigating by, you know, with your own eyes having adapted to very low levels of light, uh, which are provided by the reflected light from the sun off of the moon is truly an extraordinary experience. Um, and that is all true, but the reason I specifically wanted to talk a little bit about the moon today is because today is the 53rd anniversary of the launch of Apollo 11. <whistles> Apollo 11, of course, being, um, well, let's go back a few years from that. So that was um, July 16th, 1969. And in uh, 1961, JFK had um, provided the mission objective in which he um, said, we want to perform a crude lunar landing, crude, C-R-E-W-E-D, a crude, crude lunar landing and return to Earth. And um, the NASA site, has a, uh, which I'll link to in the show notes, has, has a lot of history there. And so I didn't actually find it. But as I remember it, of course, I was, we, weren't, we were babies for the lunar, for the actual landing that happened in 1969, both of us watched from our our places in different parts of LA. Me from the lap of my father, who had been injured, massively injured in this accident a few days before I was born. So we got to watch this from our various infant-like states. Um, <clears throat> but I believe that JFK had basically said um, before the uh, decade is out. Like he, mm -hmm. the goal was before the '60s were over, and you know they, of course, JFK was then assassinated not too long after that. But uh, the United States made it with only a few months to spare with with the Apollo 11 mission, and um, and that was 66 years after the first powered flight, which is a, a yeah. comparison one should keep in mind from the moment that the Wright brothers, I believe it was Wilbur got off the ground for 30 seconds and that counted as the first powered flight to landing men on the moon and returning them safely to earth in 66 years. It's a blink. Yeah. It's, it's such a short period of time. And the 20th century saw this acceleration of progress that of course we continue to see now and we, are, you know, we, we talk about this all the time, the hyper novelty that both plagues us, but is also uh, a testament to human ingenuity and, uh, and ability. Right. And actually not on Apollo 11, but on an earlier Apollo mission on Apollo 8 at the end of 1968, December 24th, as it as it happens. Actually, Zach, do you have the shot, the Earthrise photograph? Uh, if you could show this, uh, which will be familiar to everyone and certainly everyone who was alive then. Uh, we were uh, we were not. We were we were fetuses then. Um, uh, but this photograph which was again taken on December 24th, 1968 um, on the Apollo 8 mission, was humanity's first view of our planet from outside of our planet. And what an extraordinary philosophical moment that was. Soon followed, seven, eight months later, by visions hearing that humans were actually on a different astronomical body. Two things, yeah. yeah. I don't know if they belong right here, yeah. but that image. So first of all, there is a phenomenon of um, most or all of the astronauts who saw a, a view like this, something called the overview effect, which mm -hmm. is it is a philosophical transition. There's something yeah. about seeing uh, the entirety of humanity, you know, in one field of view um, that is hard for astronauts to describe that motivates them to try to get other people to understand what it is they have seen and experienced and what it implies. And I think it is, um, it is a, it is a profound, it is a revelation of something true that although the rest of us can glean it and we can in fact see that image, um, it is hard to appreciate what it would be like if it was your own eyes rather than a picture. Yeah, no, and it's, um, 
you know, the closest that I've experienced, I think, or the, the thing that this most reminds me of is the experience that I had repeatedly as a kid, having grown up close enough to the ocean uh, in Los Angeles that it was about a mile or so walk. And once I was, you know, seven or eight or nine, and my parents um, let me wander off um, alone because that's what good parents do do, um, I would go down to the beach and just and look out at the ocean. And my sense was simultaneously one of, wow, I'm so small. Right. I'm so small. And uh, in a way, there's a, there's a humility that is, um, that is generative that comes from that. And also, look at how much that is not known and that is yet to be discovered and that we can, that, that there is yet to be explored. And look how many opportunities await me and all of us. Yeah. And in that case, you know, the, the, the thing that I was looking at was the ocean, the vast ocean, which is so much smaller than the vastness of space and yet still so large compared to a single human life. Right. Uh, yeah, it is. It is stunning, and I mean, I, I do. This, it's the kind of thing I feel like I should check before I say it, but I'm so certain of it. Uh, I also get the same sense looking at the ocean. It, it is a it is a calibration of significance, as is looking into the night sky. If you're lucky Indeed. enough to be able to look into the night sky and see stuff, yeah. But I'm certain that the amount of ocean that one can see standing probably even if you're standing at the same you know certainly if you're standing on the cliffs looking down at the ocean but i think even if you're standing uh at the shore looking out at you know 180 degrees of ocean that is undoubtedly a space large enough uh you know you could put everybody on earth in that space you could probably put everybody who had ever lived in that space and gosh i don't know I feel quite certain of it. But anyway, maybe I'll be wrong and we'll find out. But it would be interesting to know, okay, if that's true, let's take all the people, you know, 8 billion people, right? Could you fit 8 billion people in that space? And if so, how much, you know, could they be COVID distant from each other? I mean, you know, <laughs> right? Like, I, I would love to know. But anyway, be, somebody drowning. somebody will know how to do that calculation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would be, I'd be curious to know the answer. But the other thing I wanted to say, though, about As, before you do, yeah. um, interesting that uh, what you what you refer to as the overview effect has to do with um, seeing all of humanity in one place. And your reference here again was putting all the people in your field of view. And um, I think I think it has never been the thing that I thought about is like that's all of the people, right? It's oh. it's like that's all of the existence of. Of humanity and the earth and everything that that yes we are but that everything is and that um, the the human part of it I can I can totally see how you would have a sense of sort of urgency around wanting to communicate that to the other people if you were the actual astronaut seeing Earthrise which is not there anymore um, but no it's it's okay um, but it hasn't been it hasn't been I think the source of the the deep philosophical uh, explorations that my brain has gone to. No, oh, I wasn't until this moment until you put the two of them in proximity to yeah. each other, right? That overview effect, uh, you know, at some level, maybe that's not what every astronaut sees, but there's something about it that is like, wow, they're all there. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, there's the Carl Sagan version of this, the pale blue dot, which mm -hmm. is, is even more profound because there the earth is barely recognizable you know it's so tiny yeah um but so you were going to a yeah there was there was one other thing yeah. uh that that image calls to mind you know, put the image back up and i remember it um because i think you mentioned oliver sacks somewhere recently i don't know if it was a Substack or somewhere but uh oliver sacks is somebody who's now gone but somebody who's been important to us uh through his his writing and I remember a, he was a neurologist who wrote um, who wrote basically patient accounts accounts of his patients that revealed uh, deep and sometimes universal human truths. Right, truths. So maybe maybe my favorite book of his is an anthropologist on Mars, which went into some depth on five different um, cases, um, but they're all. They're all terrific. Like, yeah, but, I haven't read a, a, a book of Oliver Sacks that I didn't find uh, compelling and surprising. Yeah, I can't remember if the vignette I'm about to describe is, I think it's the man who mistook his wife for a hat, but it might be an anthropologist on Mars. But anyway, he's got a patient who has a retrograde amnesia. That is to mm. say, 
uh, the amnesia is spreading backwards in time. So the patient thinks he's younger and younger because he doesn't remember anything beyond a certain moment, and that moment is receding towards his birth. Mm -hmm. right? It's a very profound and disruptive uh, pathology. And Sachs doesn't quite, I don't want to say he doesn't believe it, but he isn't sure. Like, you've got two explanations for such a thing. Either this person has some pathology that would explain that, or they're faking, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't know they're faking, but you need to ascertain that they are indeed not just representing this as true, but that it is actually their experience of the world. And, you know, so he describes several times, like, going in, talking to the guy, you know, having a, interviewing him, and then going away for a certain amount of time, and then coming back, mm -hmm. and the guy has no memory of him, and he re-interviews him, asks him the same questions, the guy wants the same clarifications. It's very eerie, right? Mm. But at some point, he takes, I believe, that photograph, mm -hmm. and he shows it to this guy, um, who is at that point an old man who thinks he's like in his 20s, right? And you can do things like show him a mirror. And this would have been in the 70s or 80s. So this, so his, this old man's life in his 20s would have preceded humans being able to see the earth from the outside. Right, substantially. And mm -hmm. preceded, in fact, even the discussion of doing that, mm -hmm. right? So anyway, he presents him this photograph and he says, describe what you see and the man says something like that's a picture of the moon and uh sax says no it's not that's a picture of the earth and he says it can't be because if it were you'd have to get a camera up there and sax says the equivalent of well okay. they did and the shock that the man experiences is evident, and this convinces Sachs that, in fact, I, mean, I hope I'm reporting this right, but that's my memory of the yeah. the interaction that this can compels him that is, in fact, a real pathology because the man's confused. You know, that photo is so familiar to all of us that, you know, in order to be confused by it, you'd really, especially viscerally confused, not just to mm -hmm. say that you were confused, but to be shocked by it. Yeah, and deeply um, uncomfortable to your core. Right. Yeah. yeah. What What does that mean about wh where I am in time, for example? Indeed. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess only just one more thing. Um, about the moon here, um, so this is, again, this was taken on Apollo 8, and the Apollo 8 mission, which did not land on the surface, I think. No, correct. Um, uh, I, I know that, yeah. Um, <clears throat> in late 1968, uh, but we see the moon surface in the foreground with the Earth rising above it uh, in the background. Um, but from the Earth, relative to the Earth, the moon is tidally locked. And what that means is that if you take uh, the moon's rotation around the Earth, um, the amount of time it takes for the moon to rotate around the Earth once as its year, and the amount of time that the uh, moon takes to orbit around its own axis as its day, uh, that, the moon, that the moon's uh, year is equivalent to the moon's day, which means that the same side of the moon is always facing the Earth. And so this, the, the logic I just went through where whenever you hear something um, being described as tidally locked relative to what it's orbiting around, that means that it's effectively, its day length and its year length are the same such that the um, object at the center, be it the sun if it's a planet or a planet if it's a moon, always sees the same side of the object that is orbiting it. And you know, we have in English, and I presume, although I didn't look into it, presumably other cultures and other languages as well, this sort of this idea of the dark side of the moon, right? I was going to say, and you know, there is no literal dark side of the moon because all because when we are seeing a moon that looks dark to us, that is on a new moon, the other half is is light, and when we see a full moon, the other half is dark, but we are always seeing the same face. But there is a metaphorically dark side of the moon, right? That it is dark to us. The half of the moon that we never see from this planet is dark to us because it's outside of our purview. It's outside of our possible view, and so we cannot know it. And one of the things that landing on the moon does is potentially bring the metaphorically dark side of the moon into the light for us. It brings it into our awareness at this empirical level that we never could have had before. Um, yep. Yeah. I agree, and so does orbiting the moon and all of that stuff. 
This is true. The fact that um, the fact that there is no dark side. No, literally dark side. But I, I think no I, permanently dark side. No, is, literally dark side. I really feel like the you know no, no literally dark side, but that the the darkness also refers to unknown. Well, I I agree with your metaphorical point. I mean, yeah. there's always a dark side of the moon. It's just not always the same side, right? Mm -hmm. It's a but there's a metaphorically dark side that sometimes is literally lit by photons yeah. and sometimes literally not. There um, is a mysterious side of the moon. Yeah. There's an inherently mysterious side of the moon. To us from our perspective as, as humans on the planet that it is orbiting. Yeah. Um, but the fact that there is arguably no dark side of the moon is evidence that if there is a god, he does not like Pink Floyd. Or if there's Pink Floyd, they don't like God. Those are not mutually exclusive. Mm, okay. Yeah. And? Well, just saying. Just saying. All right.